Welcome to Coral Palooza 2020. I'm Scott Winters, CEO of the Coral Restoration Foundation, and I couldn't be more excited to be with you today. When CRF started Coral Palooza, I don't think anyone ever anticipated it would or could be virtual. But here we are. Oh, how quickly the world can change. In essence, that's why Coral Palooza started in the first place. The world is changing rapidly. In recent decades, the world has changed so much that humanity is facing the loss of one of the Earth's greatest ecosystems, tropical coral reefs. The reasons for the loss are complex and varied, but Coral Palooza is about hope. The world can change rapidly, and Coral Palooza is about inspiring hope that through individual actions, no matter how great or how small, each of us can change the world. And together, the sum of these actions and these collaborations can rapidly accelerate change. So welcome in this time of change. This new, albeit unexpected format, <laughs> gives us an opportunity to connect and engage together across the world with fewer boundaries. Let's make the most of it. There's now lots to explore from all over the world. I'd like to start the events by introducing our keynote address to set the tone for the day. I'll then be back for a few minutes to say a few more things about Coral Palooza and this year's format. Then you can explore coral reef restoration around the world. So let's dive in. It is our pleasure to have Coral Palooza kicked off this year by Tom Moore, one of the world's great champions and advocates for reefs. Tom is the Coral Restoration Lead for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Restoration Center. For nearly 20 years, he has been at the vanguard for restoration, bridging academics, conservation, and policy. He leads a cross-agency, multidisciplinary team working on issues that range from the role that natural infrastructure can play in mitigating the effects of climate change to the appropriateness of genetic interventions in restoring coral reefs. In addition to his role at NOAA, Tom is co-chairman of the Coral Restoration Consortium, an international organization that brings thousands of people together to work on restoring the world's reefs. He is, he is an aggressive, big thinker, willing to tackle the hard problems, while also understanding that reefs can restore one coral at a time. So without further ado, my colleague and my friend, Tom Moore. Thanks for that kind introduction, Scott, and welcome everybody to Coral Palooza Digital 2020. I'm excited to be here today to talk a little bit about coral reefs and coral reef restoration with everyone. Are they rocks? Are they plants? Are they animals? In fact, coral reefs are all three. They're made up of small polyps that form together by the millions to create individual corals by the billions to create the reefs we know by name, and by the trillions to create the vast underwater seascapes we can see from space. Together, those reefs represent one of the largest living things on the planet. These reefs form the foundation of one of the planet's most important ecosystems, one that will be here long before humans, and one that with our help will be here long after you and I. As you gaze at pictures of the reef longer or the reef itself, you'll realize that it's not just the corals that are alive, but the whole reef is as abuzz with activity as Manhattan at Rush Hour, at least up until a few months ago. You might even see one of the nearly 100 million people that recreate on or near reefs every single year. But much more than pretty pictures, coral reefs literally feed large portions of the developing world. They play an outsized role in the world's fishery production, and provide primary food security to nearly a half billion people in Asia alone. And the reefs don't just feed these communities. They provide their first line of defense against coastal storms and serve as a revenue generator worth nearly $10 trillion. What's often lost on people, though, is for some countries and people, their entire way of life is tied to the reef. The reef is the lifeblood of their culture, their economy. It is their protector both physically and spiritually. And without it, they really do not stand a chance. For many island nations, the question is not if reef loss will destroy them. 
It's just a question of what will come first, the loss of their economy, their culture, or the unmitigated waves. And it's not just coastal communities that benefit from reefs. The same chemical defenses that corals use to protect themselves from predators on the reef are finding their way into next generation treatments for cancer, HIV, and cardiovascular disease. Who knows what other treatments might be left lurking under the surface for the viruses and the diseases that are still sure to come. Unfortunately, this is where the story takes a more somber turn. Many of you have probably heard the news over the last four years about the bleaching event that has plagued the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs worldwide. That reef system alone is estimated to have lost 50% of its coral cover in just two years. Unfortunately, the Great Barrier Reef was not the canary in the coal mine. In fact, it was the latest victim in a well-predicted mass mortality event that's been underway since the mid-1990s and gaining speed and intensity every year since. So I'm often asked to explain what exactly is going on. I'm sure many of you here know what the human body temperature is, right? 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What happens if that goes up 3 degrees Fahrenheit for a few hours? You're not feeling pretty. What about six degrees for a few hours? Things are not looking good and you're probably on your way to the emergency room. Now imagine that same six degree fever for weeks. That's what's happening to coral reefs worldwide every single year. As amazing as coral reefs are, most can simply not handle that level of heat and quickly turn a stark white. This is what we call coral bleaching. If the temperature stays high for more than a few weeks, that bleaching quickly turns to death. We've already lost 50% of the world's coral reefs to climate change, and the rest could be gone by the end of the next century. But what if we do something about climate change? Many are on the forefront of new technologies that might just help reverse the climate trend. Those revolutions might save humanity. Unfortunately, those revolutions by themselves are unlikely to save coral. Carbon already committed to the atmosphere is likely to trigger, trigger more frequent and severe mortality events for at least the next three decades, setting us up for a mass extinction event without any event. That was an unacceptable result for the billions of people that rely on coral reefs, and it certainly wasn't an acceptable answer for our team. So faced with this problem, we sat down with the experts on bringing species back from the brink at the Smithsonian Institution. What they told us was that to recover coral reefs, we needed to do three things that were actually backwards of traditional conservation. Normally, you're taught that you first solve the underlying issue, in this case, climate, before beginning to take a cautious approach to restoration and intervention. However, in our case, they prescribed that we immediately begin to rebuild populations with more diverse and resilient corals, that we work faster and more aggressively than we would have ever thought necessary and we do this all while working in the background to address the underlying problem of climate change. So to understand how to do that and how we're going to use restoration to make that difference, we need to first understand a little bit about coral reproductive biology. See, most coral species reproduce in two ways. One is simply from breaking apart and spreading genetic clones of the same individual around the reef. This is what we call asexual reproduction. The other form of reproduction is sexual reproduction. This is where the eggs of one colony come in contact with the sperm of another genetically different colony in close proximity. And this is how coral rest restoration comes into the picture. Coral restoration is literally the act of harnessing and manipulating these sexual reproduction processes to our benefit. This is where it gets a bit tricky. Though. Most coral species only have one sexual reproduction event to for many, it's a few days after the autumn full moon and in the middle of the night. During that one event, eggs and sperm are released in unison into the water column. The problem is those eggs and sperm have to reach different genetic individuals and they have to do it within a matter of minutes. When a reef has lost 90 plus percent of its corals to bleaching or disease, that is next to impossible. But it doesn't mean all is lost. We actually can play matchmaker on the reef and in the lab to help them out. Simply collecting the eggs and sperm from a handful of individuals can allow us to create thousands of new genetic individuals. Those individuals can really help us improve the diversity 
and the resilience of the corals on the reef. But unfortunately, it will take many years for them to grow up and become a functional part of the reef. So we need another tool. Most coral species also reproduce asexually. In the same way that we can repopulate forests using clippings, we can cut one coral up into hundreds of pieces. Over the course of less than a year, those few hundred small fragments can regrow and will be ready for outplanting to the reef. Or they can actually be used to create thousands of more corals for outplanting the next year. For our faster growing species, we can go from a coral the size of your pinky finger to the size of a basketball in less than one year. Fortunately, using these techniques over the last 15 years, we've been slowly building the capacity to rebuild reefs using coral reef restoration. In-water and land-based coral farms are now able to turn out tens of thousands of corals per year. And we have now have a number of restoration programs that have truly moved into farming mode. And we're successfully restoring certain reefs to their historic level of cover and function at the local level. Unfortunately, the gap that exists between success at the local level and success at the ecosystem level is not just big, it's massive. Even with these amazing successes in places that we've been working for a long time, we're not going to keep it up with the time. Continuing on the current path, it would take centuries to restore corals, even if we threw lots of money at the problem. The Great Barrier Reef is nearly 1,800 miles long. It's going to take fresh thinking to solve this problem globally, even if we're able to start solving parts of it. The easy solution, and the one we've chosen over and over, is to ignore the problem. Hope it will go away and focus on things that we can easily see and touch. As we've learned from countless times throughout history, that is a recipe for disaster. I do not see how we can simply lose 25% of the ocean's biodiversity and not think it will have drastic consequences on our planet. Giving up is not an option for me. I don't think it's an option for you. We need to shift from reaction to action, and we need all of you to be part of that solution. We need to come together as a community of scientists, politicians, advocates, educators, and students. And we need to look at multiple solutions at multiple timescales at the same time. So how are we going to do that? First, we need to dramatically expand the work we're doing today, both in terms of scale and efficiency. That means getting people like all of you watching this involved. For some, that might mean actually getting underwater soon and helping plant corals. For others, that might mean working on new technologies, business models, and helping raise awareness. Organizations like the Coral Restoration Foundation and their partners are doing amazing work, but currently can only work at a fraction of the places they're needed. What if with more support they had the resources to work in twice as many places? What if at the same time some of you helped them develop new techniques that allowed to work them five times more efficiently? That means exponential change. And in the scope and scale of restoration, that change compounded across the world can start to truly shift the needle in favor of coral reefs. But what about all those warming oceans I talked to you about earlier? You're probably just thinking we're going to throw more good corals and have a problem. Well, if we can find that exponential change with some help from Mother Nature, we might just actually have corals that can help stand up to those warming ocean temperatures that are still there. We know that after every mortality event, there are winners and losers. We also know that repeated sublethal exposure to high temperatures makes some corals strong. By combining the evolutionary underpinning of survival of the fittest with the mantra of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, we might just be able to have corals for restoration that can handle that six degree fever a little bit better than their native counterparts. We're on the cusp of change now and with continued support can likely get there in a few years. But that will only get us part of the way. We need to embrace the lessons learned from other fields and apply them to the field of coral reef restoration. We have to stop having coral biologists trying to solve problems with PVC pipe duct tape and zip ties, and start moving towards custom, purpose-built solutions. What if we challenge the assumption that coral reef restoration has to be performed by snorkelers and scuba divers? Why I love diving as much as the next person, it's unlikely that we will ever be able to improve 
human base diver efficiency by more than five to 10 times. And even then, even if we would still be limited by the fact that a diver can only get a good three hours of work in every day, and even then, probably only half the days in a given year. We need to harness the power of automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence to work at scale, to, to work at the scales that will be necessary to address the global challenge. These are not solutions that will be available overnight, but we need to start investing in them now so that they're available when we need them. While at the same time, working hard with the tools that we have available today to make all the change we can and buy time. Unlike other global challenges, it's unlikely the typical market forces will step in to solve this problem. It's gonna to have to be solved by people with crazy ideas and the passion to turn those crazy ideas into breakthroughs. In other words, it's gonna to have to be solved by people that are just like you that are tuning in to listen today and participate in this event. The challenges we face are similar to hurdles that have been overcome in other fields. Those of us that have looked closely at the problem firmly believe the tech exists to solve it. We just need the right people sitting at the same table with an incentive to solve it. The challenge is huge. The goal is audacious, but saving coral reefs might just help save the world. Whether helping plant a single coral at a thousand, whether it's building awareness or contributing resources, there is a role for everyone. I encourage all of you to explore all the coral clues that digital has to offer over the next few days and find the best place for you to help. I encourage all of you to join us on this journey to success. We firmly believe we can get there, but it's going to take everyone involved to make it happen. Thank you, and have a great day and week enjoying Coral Palooza Digital. Thanks, Tom. That was spectacular and inspiring. I told you he had big ideas. And change comes from both big ideas and from small ideas. Insights from experts, aha moments from hobbyists, bridge building across disciplines, and from seemingly simple questions that I can't answer from children, like my children. Coral Palooza is about inspiring hope, that everyone can take action and be part of the solution. The challenges that our reefs are facing are hard. There is no denying that. This isn't about pretending those big issues don't exist or trying to be blindly optimistic. The hard issues need to be wrestled with head on. But regardless of what the issue is or how big the challenge may be, solutions need to start with individual action. Great waves of change occur through individual action. At the end of the day, reef restoration happens one coral at a time and changing the world occurs one person at a time. So let's change the world together. Through this crazy new virtual format, we can explore reef restoration projects from all over the world. We can participate in kids' activities, ask expert questions, and learn about some of the cutting edge work that's being done in the field. But at the end, this is about you. I want you to be inspired to take action. If it's saving coral reefs, great. But even if it's something else to help our environment, that's the goal. We're all interconnected, and we're all connected in some way to the world's coral reefs. To be clear, this is not a fundraising program, and we want it to be free for everybody. What we want, what I want, is your engagement. Every great change starts with one individual taking action. So thank you, and together, let's Coral Palooza.